congratulations. You just got yourself a van or trap to catch invasive starlings or house sparrows, but you're here because you're just not catching anything. Don't worry, you've come to the right place and I'm going to walk you through a few ways to help it go a little bit better for you. None of these tactics are going to guarantee you catch a house sparrow or starling, but they will certainly improve your chances. And just in case, I do want to put this disclaimer out there for people who are new to this channel or this concept, but a van urt trap is a bird nest box trap that is used to trap invasive house sparrows and European starlings that regularly kill native cavity nesting songbirds. A van urt trap is a live trap, which means that it's not the type of trap that would kill or intentionally harm an animal. Another thing I have to put out there is that when you engage in trapping house sparrows or starlings, it is very, very important that you follow some safety rules to ensure that native birds aren't harmed in the process. I have a link in the description to a video with a lot of safety rules for van urt traps, and it's something you really need to watch. I'd watch that first before you even watch this video, or at least watch before you start seriously trapping especially if you're new to the stuff. Okay, so with that, let's get right into it. Something standard on the Van Ur trap is the orange dot, but if you notice mine, they don't have them. The orange dot is this bright indicator to help you easily see when the trap is sprung and you've caught something. And in theory, this is really, really helpful, but in practice, this has actually been really problematic. See, the thing is, orange and black is also the instinctive biological warning color combinations. If you've pulled your Van Ert trap out of its packaging and installed it only to find how sparrows are suddenly not interested in the box and aren't going into it, Step one is to remove that orange dot. Now you may be a little nervous that you won't see whether the trap has sprung. So what a lot of people do is they remove the orange sticker and then they glue some grass or feathers or other material to the area. For house sparrows, this is actually potentially gonna attract them a little more. And when the trap has sprung, you're actually going to see stuff that you glued showing out of the entry hole, which is then the signal that you need that your trap has sprung. When really struggling to catch an invasive bird, adding some straw or grass or feathers to the entry hole itself, making it stick out just a little bit, can sometimes entice the birds. This is especially true for house sparrows. And clipped grass is really easy to come by. Just grab some and stuff it right in the entry hole so a few pieces are sticking out. You can even add some within the box itself. And adding a little material into the box itself is another strategy to focus on that can really help out. If you're having a little trouble, before even setting the trap up, try adding some grass or pine needles or wood shavings into the nest box itself. Bait the inside of the box with material real nicely. With house sparrows, sometimes just making the box look like it's been used entices them more. And that can sometimes work similarly for starlings. You may find that these birds are actually removing some of that nesting material you placed in the box and that makes it nice for them and that's a good sign for you. It shows that they're interested. Once you've had a little more interest going on you can mount the trap and you'll have a lot better success catching something. A lot of times people will bait larger traps like repeater and funnel traps with food that house sparrows or starlings like. For instance bread or even goldfish crackers or popcorn are great options to attract house sparrows to a repeating trap. For starlings, cheap suet is really the way to go. They love it. I found that using the same method is sometimes helpful when there's reluctance for one of these invasive birds to enter the box after setting the van or trap up. Usually I'll just put a little bit of bread inside the box itself and just a little bit right on the entry hole for a house sparrow and that reluctance seems to fade pretty quickly. For starlings, you can do the same thing. Just use suet, a little bit of suet inside the nest box. Just remember to remove any remaining food items at the end of the day. And of course, be sure to disengage your trap for safety reasons. Now, this next tip may seem <laughs> obvious, but it's still worth mentioning. And that's to make sure that your trap box or decoy box has the right specifications for the bird that you're trying to catch. For instance, a one and a half inch entry hole works for house sparrows. Actually, they can fit into a one and a quarter inch entry hole, but that extra quarter of an inch bigger makes it nice and easy for them to get in. Really all you need is a standard bluebird nest box to catch a house sparrow. I'll have a video that I'll post in the description about how to make a nest box trap out of cardboard. It's the first video I ever made, so it's pretty raw and rough, but it'll give you a good idea at least. 
For starlings, a one and a half inch entry hole usually excludes them. Even a one and nine sixteenth inch hole is pretty tight, so something larger will enable you to catch them. But if you're really trying to trap them, having something closer to two inches will really help out. You'll also want to use a larger box for starlings, something suited for northern flickers or American kestrels with a height of at least 12 inches is what to look for. A really frustrating aspect of using nest box traps happens when two different species are interested in the same box. For instance, maybe a bluebird is working on the nest when suddenly a house sparrow comes around. What ends up happening is you run out, you set the nest box trap up in the box after seeing the house sparrow, and as soon as you do, the bluebird returns. So then you run out again, you pull the trap out, and that way you don't risk the bluebird getting caught and then becoming nervous about the nest box. But as soon as you do that, the house sparrow returns and starts going back into the box. This is where using a little bit of knowledge about size exclusion and some hole reducers can really make things easier, or at least a little less less frustrating. With the bluebird and house sparrow situation, if you add a one and a quarter inch hole reducer to the nest box, the bluebird usually won't be able to get in. And this is just a temporary situation, but it will allow the house sparrow to enter. At this point, you can worry a little less about accidentally catching the bluebird and focus on catching the house sparrow. Once the house sparrow or both house sparrows, if he had a mate, have come around and are trapped and dealt with, take the hole reducer off and the bluebirds usually stay pretty curious and once they find they can get into the box, they'll start building again. The same methodology can be used for catching starlings. By reducing that hole to two inches, you can minimize the risk of catching a northern flicker that uses a larger entry hole or an American kestrel and focus on catching your starling. There are some exceptions here. Sometimes you just get a skinny bird and actually this can really start happening as the nesting season hits full swing. This is because birds lose a significant amount of body mass after their nestlings hatch. So if your bluebirds are on their second brood, they may not have gotten back to their original weight yet and could slip through that smaller hole. Another problem is that size exclusion isn't going to exclude everything. For instance, a titmouse can fit into a smaller entry <laughs> hole. So reducing the hole size to one and a quarter inch if you're playing musical nest box between a titmouse and a house sparrow isn't going to make a difference. But overall, this concept can really help out, especially when you know the species that you're dealing with and the hole size requirements for those species. One of the reasons you might be struggling to catch a house sparrow or European starling in a nest box could have to do with seasonality. A nest box trap is really going to be effective during the nesting season when these birds are looking for nesting sites. This is going to be your spring and summer months, pretty much. I will put it out there though, that since winter stretches into most of March, when birds start scouting for nesting locations for many areas in North America, that it would still be possible to catch an invasive bird during the late winter period, if that makes sense. But if it's mid to late fall or early to mid winter, you'll probably have very little success using an S box trap. One issue that actually comes up quite a bit when it comes to Van Ert trap problems is when you, the trap just isn't springing. And the way to tell if that's happening is if you've seen a house sparrow or starling go into the box repeatedly and the trap just isn't snapping. I apologize too, because while planning and then shooting this video, this one extremely common issue completely escaped my mind, but thankfully I remembered just before it was too late. Anyway, there are a few reasons that this can happen, and the first reason is that when you set the trap to be active, you secured it a little too much by that hook. When setting the trap, you barely want the hook to hold the flap in place. This makes it more sensitive and quicker to shut. If you're fully wedging it behind the hook, it may not spring as easily. In fact, when I checked with others, just to confirm if there were any safety concerns in doing it this way, there are none by the way, a, a few people mentioned that the trap wouldn't even spring if they had it too secure. So when setting the trap, let that hook just barely hold it so that it'll readily spring. The next reason could be that your mounting screws are too loose or uh, sticking out too much. And this is a situation I've seen come up a few times and I'm really not quite sure what leads to these issues other than the trap kind of moving around and the bird hopping past the trigger or not getting all of its pressure on that trigger. I will say that if you're resetting the trap to be pretty sensitive with that hook barely touching, this should be less of an issue. But if you've been setting your trap to be pretty, pretty sensitive, check your screws. 
you might want to just tighten them a bit and then retest using a rock or a stick. The last cause is if you've had an old trap or you got your trap off Amazon. With old traps, they might not be flexing or moving as easily. If that's the case, just you can try to fix it or just buy another one. They're pretty affordable. If you got your trap off Amazon, this could be the issue. Sometimes the traps off Amazon are knockoffs. They're not the actual thing. So in that case, if you're finding that problem and you bought it off Amazon, I would just go to vanerttraps.com and buy your trap there. Before I close out here, I just want to invite anyone who's watching this video who may have other tips to include that in the comments below. If we can get a good list going, what I'll do is I'll compile that into a pinned comment and maybe even do an update video down the road. Your experience could really help a lot of people out. And finally, if you want to learn more about managing invasive birds, check out this playlist. This one focuses a lot on house sparrows, but a lot of the information can transfer to starlings and I will continue to add to it.